Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to the Cornerstone Church Sermons Podcast. To learn more about our ministry and how we're helping people follow Jesus, visit our website at cornerstonechurch.community. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram under the name cstone.central. We hope you enjoy today's message. Well, amen. How beautiful was that to start off with God's word this morning? But hey, there's a, there's a difference between knowledge and discovery. And you all look like a sharp group. It seems like you guys got it all together. And I'm sure you guys know this already, but I'm just going to share that the highest point in the state of Arizona is Humphreys Peak at a height of 12,633 feet. And back in 2013, the Nave family, as the picture shows, had the opportunity to take the hike, to discover Mount Humphreys for ourselves. As you can see, I'm in the bottom right. I look ecstatic. Like, I am overjoyed that we were able to do this on this particular day. And when you read about the hike, the the climb, you can read that it's like, eight to nine hours long. You can read about how it has two false peaks, but it's another to experience it for yourself. It's another for me and my family to take the climb, for it to take five hours to get to the top, four hours to come down. And and you know that there are these false peaks. You know that it's like a trick in, in your head, but you see it and you think, oh, we're almost there. We've almost made it. And then you round to the other side of the mountain and see you've got a long way to go. See, there's a difference between knowing about something and truly discovering it for yourself. Another example of this is a month or two ago, me and Sammy, my wife, we went to Myrtle Beach for a little trip, and we'd never been there before, so we were checking out all the different food places, and one of the places that we stopped was Taco Mundo. And one of the cute things that that my wife does is wherever we go to eat, she will ask the waiter or the waitress, like, what's the favorite here? Like, what, what do people get when they eat here, like she literally did this at O'Charlie's a few weeks ago here in Marion. She asked the waitress, what do people get at O'Charlie's? I think it's pretty funny. But as this waitress is explaining the food, she's explaining the different tacos that they have, the carne asada, the tempura shrimp, the Hawaiian chicken. She's describing the street corn on the cob. And so all of us right now are like imagining the food and the flavor. But to truly discover that food, you must taste and see the goodness of Taco Mundo. There's a difference between knowledge and discovery. And prayer is the same way. Prayer is something that we are to walk in and to discover each and every day. And here's the thing. You could be a professional at getting in the position of prayer. You can know how to pray all you want. You can know how to bow your head, close your eyes, put your hands in the international symbol of prayer. You can be a professional at that, but what is the point in prayer if you don't actually do it? Here's some profound quotes that I want to share with you this morning about prayer. Philip Yancey says that we learn to pray by praying. Richard Foster says, by praying, we learn to pray. Mother Teresa was asked, how do we learn to pray? Her response by praying. And in Luke 11, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus responds by saying, pray. And so you can quote me this morning by saying, if this teaching stops at teaching, it will not do you any good because prayer is about discovery. And in Luke 11, which is the other reference to the Lord's prayer found in scripture, it is prompted by the disciples asking Jesus, like I mentioned, teach us how to To pray, and I find it so interesting that that's the question the disciples asked Jesus. See, it wasn't Jesus teach us how to heal the sick. It wasn't Jesus teach us how to cast out demons, to walk on water, to turn water into the wine, all these cool things from from the outside. They didn't ask that, but they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And it's because the people closest to Jesus understood that there was some. There's something profound about prayer when you prayed like Jesus. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you on this mysterious journey we call prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray like Jesus. 
And so I'm going to ask you guys to do something. I know Dustin kind of set the scene a little bit of inviting Jesus in to work and to move this morning. But I'm going to ask you to do something that may be uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you just to put your hands out like this as you sit, to posture yourself. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the text. But by doing this, it's saying, God, take what needs to be taken. Take away the distractions. Take away the noise. Take away what I came in here carrying this morning. But not, but not only is it saying, God, take, but God, I want to receive. God, I want to hear from you this morning. So posture yourself humbly before him this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you've done for us. And we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the Lord's prayer that you shared on the Sermon on the Mount and, and the, the, just the goodness of this prayer and how it affects our lives. And so, God, I pray that you speak through me this morning, that these not be my words, but they be yours. And I pray that you take away the distractions. You take away the noise. You strip away what needs to be stripped and that we receive from you this morning. So, God, we love you. And we are waiting with anticipation to receive your word this morning. God, we love you and we praise you. It's your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you have your Bible with you this morning, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 6, starting off in verse 5. And in the first few verses, Jesus calls out these two groups of people. And he's not calling these people out because they're doing such a great job. He's not calling them out and saying, hey, these guys are killing the game when it comes to prayer. But he's saying... Guys, do not be like them. Do not pray like them. And so it is a warning to us. And so those two groups, he says, do not pray like the hypocrites and do not pray like the Gentiles. And so starting off, we're going to go to verse 5. It says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And so back then, the Jewish people had this this rhythm of prayer that they would partake in every single day. Typically, they would stop three times a day to pray. And so oftentimes they would try to get to the synagogue, the places of worship. But if something in life came up, like work or travels, they would simply stop where they were at and they would spend time in prayer. And that's why Jesus references the street corners here. See, for the Jewish culture, prayer was a focal point to their everyday life. And I, and I commend this because instead of fitting prayer around their lives, they fit their lives around prayer. Such an admirable thing to do. And I think that's something that we could easily start to do as well. And so just a simple challenge for you this morning. Set a time each day this week to pray. Set an alarm on your phone, a reoccurring alarm to pray, to stop, and to pray to God every single day. And now back to what what Jesus was saying. The problem was not that they were stopping. The problem isn't the location of their prayer. It wasn't because they were in the synagogues or in the street corners. That's not what Jesus is getting at. But what Jesus is calling out and pointing out is that the heart of prayer matters. And Jesus says when someone prays with the wrong heart motive or they're so concerned about what other people are thinking about them, those people, when they pray, they are being hypocrites. They are flat out hypocrites. And the word hypocrite that we use in the English language comes from the Greek word hypocrite, which means an actor or an interpreter from underneath. And so for the crowd that Jesus was speaking to, they would have understood a hypocrite as someone who is putting on a show. And so Jesus is stepping back and saying, I know what's going on. Like, I know what these people are doing. They're going about their day and they're coming to pray. They're putting on their religious mask and acting like they have it all together. See, hypocrites portray themselves as someone who they are truly not on the inside. And for Jesus, this is a huge problem. And in the book of Matthew in particular, there's this strong emphasis from Jesus to call out these hypocrites. So 17 times in the New Testament, hypocrite is used. 13 times in the book of Matthew and seven times directed at the scribes and Pharisees. 
And so one thing that, that God has been teaching me in my life in this season, and in particular with prayer, is that God desires our presence over presentation. He desires for us to be present with him instead of trying to present to him. And I think oftentimes we get that flipped. We try and present to God. We try to present to those around us and make people think that we're somebody that we are truly not. And we do that with our prayers as well. And in Matthew 23, 27, Jesus calls him out. He says, woe to you. You scribes and Pharisees, you are hypocrites. On the outside, you look like a whitewashed tomb. You look beautiful. You look like you have it all together. But on the inside, you are filled with dead bones. And so what Jesus is saying is you look good. Like you look like you have it all together. You look like you are spiritual. But on the inside, you are falling apart. Like on the inside, you are dead. And man, oh man, has that been me in my life? Like too many times have I been presenting instead of being present. Like as a pastor's kid, I would present to the church, to the kids at school, as if I was perfect, as if I had my life together when truly on the inside I was hurting and I was broken. And now as a pastor, I'm a people pleaser, so thanks dad for this, Um, but I want you to be impressed by me. I kind of want you to be impressed by the way that I speak, the way that I pray. I present instead of being present way too many times. And some of you may feel this same weight, this same pressure. Because maybe for you, you're the only Christian friend in your friend group. And you don't want to mess up. Like You don't want people to fall further away from God because of your actions. So you try to impress. You try to present as if you are good. And I was reminded of this this past week that God can do more with your authenticity than your fraudulence. Like God wants you, not who you are. He wants you to be present with him. And in regards to prayer, he wants you to pray as you can, not as you can't. And so after calling out the hypocrites, he then goes on to explain a higher way of praying, the type of prayer that his kingdom people experience, and that's found in verse 6. And he says, but when you pray, my followers, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, when Jesus says to go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father, I literally think that's what he's recommending. He's asking us to do, to go into our rooms and pray. But more than that, I think it's to symbolize how we enter into prayer. That when we pray, we are so unconcerned with our setting. That we are so unconcerned with who's, who's listening or who's watching. We close the doors to our mind mentally and we pray to our Father. Like we are to exert energy to escape with him. And we see this played out in Jesus' life many of times. And Jesus was a busy man. And so if you use busyness as an excuse to, to get, stay away from prayer, it doesn't, doesn't add up. Because Jesus was a busy man. Like he was being followed all the time in his ministry. People wanting to hear his teaching. People wanting to be healed. But Jesus oftentimes escaped from the crowd. He would go to a secluded place and he would spend time with God. He would spend time with his father. And then after doing that, he would then reunite with his disciples and reunite with the crowd. A lady from... Central Christian Church on staff that where I'm up in Mount Vernon. She just got back from a trip to Israel where they were uh, hiking to all these different biblical sites. And I think she said they walked 71 miles in nine days. And so like she was walking and traveling a lot. And she said a lot of the terrain was difficult up and down mountains. And she said, Maria said that one of the places that they hiked up was Mount Arbel, which was a place that is believed that Jesus escaped from the crowd, from his disciples and went to pray. And Maria said that this hike was strenuous. Like it was difficult. It was long. It was tiring. And by the time she got up to the top, she just wanted to sit and relax. And so as they all, the whole group got to the top of the mountain, the guide for this particular trip asked them a question. 
And the question that the guide asked this group was, how hard are you willing to work to be alone with the Father? And I think that's a fair question for us to ask ourselves today. How hard are you willing to work to be alone with the Father? And we all need it. Like, we all need that time. We all need that space to spend time in prayer. And so as you're, like, thinking through, where is a a room, where is a place that I can pray? Maybe it's a room that hasn't been used in a while. Or maybe it's just a corner in your room where you have your nice chair and your coffee table. Or maybe for you, you have a nice outdoor seating area where you can go and spend time with God or, or trails. Or maybe for you, you are busy. And your quiet space is your car when you're driving home or when you're sitting in the driveway a quiet place to spend time with him. Take Jesus' words, not just figuratively, but literally, and find a place to spend time in prayer. And so don't pray like a hypocrite does. Don't pray concerning what other people are thinking. Don't be concerned about what other people are saying about the way that you pray. Pray with your Father in mind. Verse 7. This is the second group. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And so the second group of people, the Gentiles, were people who believed in gods, but not the one true God. They worship and serve these little G gods, so not the one true God. And I don't know why they decided to follow these gods, because it's kind of sad, but they believed that their gods didn't care about them that their gods weren't concerned with their day-to-day lives. And so what they would do is they would heap up empty words. They would heap up empty phrases trying to get the attention of their gods. And so their hopes were that if I said the right word, if I, if I say the code word, then the gods will listen, then the gods will pay attention to me. And Jesus is saying, hey, this is not how it works. He flips the world's ideas on his head and he says, that is not how my kingdom works. This is how my kingdom works, looking in verse 8. He says, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so here's the truth. Your behavior does not get his attention. Your words do not get God's attention. Because you already have it. Like right now, as you are sitting, breathing, doing nothing, you have the attention of the God of the universe. And not only do you have his attention, but he knows everything that you need before you even ask. Like you already have it. And oftentimes when we think about that verse, he he knows what we need before we even ask. It makes us think like, well, what's the point? Why should I even go to him in prayer? He already knows what I need. But what if we flipped it and thought about it differently? And thought about it as he knows, like God, God knows what I need before I even say anything to him. But yet he still wants to hear from me. But yet he still wants to hear from little old Zach. Like what an encouraging message that the God of the universe has our attention. And he wants you to come to him with all of your prayers. The good the bad and the ugly, all the prayers that are shared in anger and all of the prayers that are shared in joy. He can take your prayer. He can take real prayer because real prayer does not offend him. And he wants you to pray pray to him as you are because when you are real with him, that's when he can truly become your rock. When you come to him as you are, that is when he can truly become the refuge that you seek. If you're coming to him in a fake way of prayer, he can't be that rock. He can't be that refuge. And this goes back to what uh, we were talking about with the hypocrites. But God wants your heart in prayer, not just your mouth in prayer. And with prayer, we don't have to get it right every time. Like we don't have to say every word clearly every single time. Or we don't have to list out all of our needs or then God will forget and he won't be giving it to us. That's not how it works. He knows He knows what we need. And that should give us great security as we come to him in prayer. And think back to to Taylor. 
The little girl that recited the Lord's Prayer, like as soon as she, she started speaking, I could hear it in the room. Everybody's like, aw, like, like how cute. A little, and it was, it was, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful to see a little girl reciting the Lord's Prayer, memorizing scripture and praying to God. It brings us joy to see a child of God pray. And I guarantee not one of you in this room, as Taylor was reciting the Lord's Prayer, was like, oh, Taylor, you said that word incorrectly. Or Taylor, can you speak up? I can't understand what you're saying. No, you didn't respond that way. When you saw a child of God praying, it brought you joy. And the way that you see Taylor praying is the way that God sees you when you pray. Like he is overflowed with joy. Like he loves when his kids talk to him. He loves when his kids pray. He's not thinking, hey, you need to speak up. Hey, I can't hear you clearly. He isn't grading you in prayer, but he is hearing you in prayer. God loves to hear the voice of his children. And so don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray like the Gentiles. And after this section, Jesus starts to walk through what the Lord's prayer looks like. And he says, this is a model of prayer. He says to pray like this. And so for me, I've made it a practice to recite the Lord's prayer every morning and every night. And, and I've been familiar with the Lord's prayer growing up in church my whole life. I knew about the Lord's prayer, but I hadn't discovered it for myself. I hadn't looked at it intently like I have done now. And so an easy thing for us to do this week is to memorize the Lord's Prayer. Like take time throughout the week to memorize the Lord's Prayer and say it every morning and every night. And maybe you're not good at memorizing things, that's okay. But take it a section at a time. Take it a verse at a time and look at it deeply and try to understand and discover it for yourself. George Herbert says this about prayer, that prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. And so maybe for you, the Lord's Prayer is the key of your day and the lock of your night. But let's walk through the Lord's Prayer this morning, verse by verse, and see how Jesus teaches us to pray. So we'll start off in verse 9. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this area of my prayer life has, has been a drastic change because when I used to pray, I did not approach prayer lightly. Like for me, it was a come and go. Like I think of it as like a fast food. I would come, tell my order, I would get it, and I would go on as my day please. But one thing that, that I've started to do, and, and I'm a visual guy, is that I would literally posture myself in prayer. And so I would, I would get on my knees or I would literally lay on my face. And, and as a visual, I would just imagine that I am at the feet of God that I'm at the foot of his throne, and that I am not even worthy to look at him. Hallowed be your name, God. And in Exodus 33, the Lord uh, talks to Moses and says that no man can look upon my face and live. And so that puts me in my place rightly, that I am not worthy to be in his presence, but yet he still welcomes me. But yet he still wants to hear my voice. See, we are to approach prayer humbly. But not only is he holy, but we are to call him Father. We are to show him reverence, yes, but also give him adoration as our Father. And when you think about giving adoration to God and calling him Father, it's not only for him, but it's also given back to us in return. Because see, to call him Father, to identify him as your Father, is then to identify yourself as his child, as his son or daughter, it is declaring when you say, our Father in heaven, it is saying, I am a child of God. And so when you pray, approach him rightly. Recognize him as a holy God, yes, but also our Father. Verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now when we, when we pray, as Christians, our deepest desire should be for God to be in all of it, that his kingdom come, 
that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we pray this way, it gives us the right perspective. It helps us to see creation the way that God sees it. It helps us to see other people the way that God sees them. See, it is inviting him in to do a work, to redeem the world. But to seek his will is humbling. Like it is not an easy thing to do, especially at first. And in discussing this with Dustin, looking over this passage, your will be done. I think his will, God's will, can often bring about a negative connotation or, or a thought in our, in our lives. Like, oh, guess I got to submit to his will today. Like, this ain't going to be fun. This ain't going to be easy. God's a Debbie Downer. He doesn't want me to have a great life, but I'm going to be the good Christian. I'm going to submit to his will. And in the beginning, it is difficult. Yes, because it goes against our flesh. It goes against how we naturally feel. But his will is truly for your good. To ask for his will is to ask God to strip away the junk, to strip away the sin, and that we become more and more like him every single day. Because his will brings life to the full. And see, his will is not for our detriment, but for our good. But how do we know his will? Like, how do we know what God wants to do in our lives? Well, we have to, we have to listen. Like, we have to be in tune with the Spirit. And when we think about prayer, prayer is a conversation between you and God. But how often do our prayers look like conversations? Like, honestly, they don't. Because prayer is so one-sided. It's us going to God, God, do this, God, do that, God, do this. But we don't sit. Like, we don't try and listen to his voice. And so I'm going to, another challenge for you this week is to sit with him. Like, truly sit with him and don't say a word. And yes, you can prompt that time of silence, of praying to God, God, may your will be done in my life. God, may I hear from you. Reveal to me what needs to be revealed. But then sit. And allow God the opportunity to speak. May God allow, uh, may God speak his will over your life. And so set a timer on your phone. Whether it's 30 seconds, a minute, set a time to sit and listen with him. And I'll tell you, whenever I first started doing this, it felt a little weird. It felt a little awkward. I had thoughts like, am I doing this right? Is, Is it even working? And you won't hear every time. You won't feel a nudging every time, but there will be a time where you sense his presence, where you sense his direction and his nudging. And so don't just say, God, your will be done in my life, but take time to seek and to find out what his will for your life truly is. Verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, when when Jesus is saying this to the crowd, I imagine that he has the people of the United States on his mind. That Jesus imagined a people who were so self-dependent, so self-reliant, that they would literally have food stored up in their pantries for weeks to come. See, and especially with 4th of July weekend, like our independence um, is, is a blessing. Don't get me wrong. It is a blessing to live in America, but to live the way that Jesus calls us, Living in America can oftentimes be a stumbling block. Because here's the mindset that we have when we read, give us this day our daily bread. We think, God, why would I need you to provide for me when I've already provided for myself? Why would I need you to provide for me when I already have a pantry full that I've worked for to provide for my family? That's the thought that we have. But the truth is, what you think you have provided for yourself was provided by him in the first place. And what Jesus is telling us and is inviting us into is to invite him into every single aspect of our lives, even our daily bread. We are to go to him and ask that he provides again and again and again. And like I said, when we pray like this, even for our daily bread, it is inviting God into every single aspect. He wants you to come to him with everything. The big things, the small things, the most trivial things. He wants to be involved. The creator of the universe wants to be involved even in your daily bread. 
Verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So here's the truth with with this and forgiveness. If you deny forgiving others, you then deny the Father forgiving you. If you want to read that for yourself, go and read verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6. And Jesus was the best teacher. It's called the, the best sermon ever for a reason. Because Jesus starts off this section by saying, Father, forgive us our debts. It is a call for us to reflect, to look where we have fallen short, where we have sinned against God and other people and recognize that we have been forgiven of much. And because of the forgiveness we have received first, we are then to give it to others. And I know forgiveness is tough. Like it is not, it's an easier thing to say than to do it. And so if you are struggling or working through a season of unforgiveness, I would challenge you to read Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It is a great parable on forgiveness. It helps put things into perspective of us. But forgiveness is all about making right our relationships. Making right our relationship with God vertically first and making right our relationships horizontally with others. And as difficult as forgiveness is, To truly forgive is to like receive a breath of fresh air. It is to take off the weighted jacket that you've been carrying for so long because forgiveness is life. And because of forgiveness we have received first, by the grace of God, we then forgive others. Last but not least, verse 13. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, when we, when we read and we hear temptation in this verse, it can, it can tend to trip us up a little bit because we think, oh, well, can't God, God doesn't tempt us with evil. How, how does this make sense? But temptation here in this verse simply means a test. And so scripture makes it very clear that God cannot tempt man with evil. And James 1.13 is a great passage that displays that. But although God does not tempt us himself, he does allow his children to go through seasons of testing. Like even think about Jesus, the son of God. Like after he was baptized and was about to start out on his ministry, he was led out by the spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. See, we know that we will be tested because of our faith. We know because of our fleshly desires, we will go through seasons of temptation. But what what Jesus is, is setting for us here in the Lord's Prayer is that it's okay to ask God to deliver you from it, to take you from those places of temptation, that there is nothing wrong with confessing. And honestly, it's humbling ourselves before him and saying, God, I'm not very good here. Like, this is not a strong point of mine. God, protect me, lead me, spare me from this tempting place. But we all know because of who we serve that we will be tested, that we will go through trials. And so again, we are to humble ourselves before God and to say, God, you know me. You know me better than I know myself. You know I will fall short. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lean on you. I'm going to lean on your strength to get me through this place. And so even though we will find ourselves in the valley, in the low places of life. We also know that we have a good shepherd who will walk alongside of us, that will protect us and will comfort us and will lead us into victory. But he will lead you only if you allow him to lead. Like only if you humble yourself before him. And when we do, he is faithful. He is faithful to lead you through. And so prayer is a path of discovery. Are you willing to walk in it? Now, as we we close and and wrap this up, there are two camps in the room when when hearing prayer. The first group is excited. Like you're encouraged. You're like, man, I've never really heard the Lord's Prayer taught that way, or I've never really looked at it this deeply. I've, I've never really thought of the intimacy and the reverence and the awe and just just the great relationship that is found through prayer. I want to discover that for, my, for myself. I want to walk in it. I want to put in the work 
to grow in my relationship with him. That's, that's what some of you are thinking, and that is awesome. I hope you do it this week. But there are others of you in the room, the second camp, that when you heard Taylor start to recite the Lord's Prayer and, and you heard me say we're going to be speaking on prayer, your chest started to tighten. Because prayer for you is kind of a sore subject. Like prayer is disappointing. Because for you, you've prayed. Like you've given it a shot. You've prayed and prayed and prayed and it seemed like nothing even worked. And some of you have even wondered, is God listening? Does God even care? Like what is the point in prayer? And so when we talk about prayer, you are reminded of the anger that you have towards God. And that's me. That's what I am walking through. Prayer is not just this easy thing in my life. And for the last year, it has been the hardest year of my life. And for, for me and my family, like I, I'm not in a place to be able to share that, but for God's glory, I will be able to. One day, my family will be able to speak of it. One day, and to minister to others. But this year has been hard. And there were days where I prayed and prayed and prayed. And I was on my knees. I was on my face, calling out to him. And God heard it from me, like he did. He heard me when I was comforted and was at peace with him. And he heard me when I was angry. Like he heard me when I was yelling at him. And through this season, I was faithful. I sought him. I was obedient to him. I asked other people to pray for the situation. I did all of the right things. But God didn't answer my prayers as I, as I requested. And I've been in a season, I'm working through it, where I thought, God, do you even care? God, are you even listening? Like, why am I praying? Is God even to be trusted with my prayers? And so hear me this morning. I'm not just this pastor up here saying, pray because it's easy. Pray because it'll get you through the difficult times and nothing will ever go wrong in your life. <laughs> I know it's not. I know it's not the, the truth. That prayer is hard. That prayer is work. And that prayer doesn't always turn out in the way that we ask. That prayer is a bit of a mystery. That there's not a scientific equation that if you do this, this, and this, then God will grant your requests and grant your prayers just as you ask. And so I know, and I am walking through, that prayer is a mystery. But what I also know in my heart is that my Father is not. That He is not a mystery that we have a good father, a father that loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you so that we could be in a relationship with him, that we have a good father who hears you and is sovereign and is working in every situation, whether it's the way that you want it to or not, we have to trust him with it. I know that prayer is a mystery, but our father is not. And so I challenge you in the mystery of prayer, trust God. In the, in the silence of prayer, trust God. In the disappointing times of prayer, trust God. And when God is answering your prayers, when you hear his voice, trust God. And when he's moving on your behalf in the way that you are praying and you are seeking his will, continue to trust God. <laughs> Our Father, is worthy to be trusted with our prayers. And so Jesus has set the table. He has invited us to this feast. We have a time right now as we're going into communion to stop, to reflect, to pray, and to call out to him. And we do this because there is life in his presence. I challenge you, be real with him today. I come as you are. Pray as you are, whether you are on a mountaintop and feeling great about your faith or you are in a valley, come to him with your prayers. Humble yourself before him. Because that's the only way he will get you through, I promise. 
And so like I said at the beginning, if this teaching stops at teaching, it will not do you any good because prayer is about discovery. So prayer will change your life, but will you allow it? Will you allow it?